Well, I'm Becky. I'm Tom. Tom Becky. All right. And um, I live in Winston. I live in Durham. Okay. And I've lived many years in the mountains here in Asheville, too. And I originally am from Raleigh, but I lived in North Dakota for a number of years. And uh, North Dakota is one of the, well, it was one of the hotbeds of co-op development. And so that's where I got my training. And decided to return home. My mother is still living in North in Raleigh, and so I decided to come back closer to her. And that's when uh, Thomas and I started working again. I'm a, a lawyer by trade and training, and um, work for the last 10 years essentially with small businesses, with startups, basically doing corporate law for regular folks. And um, living in the mountains, I got but bold to help out with uh, starting up a small cooperative of Latina women who wanted to make tortillas, basically as a way of creating an income for women that didn't really have much in the way of job opportunities otherwise. That was a great project. Um, became more involved with Center for Participatory Change, which was the nonprofit that was um, kind of incubating that, and got further and further into this idea of cooperative enterprise as a way of um, basically distributing ownership and, and keeping economic activity intact at a grassroots level in contrast to the more um, extractive investment model that um, prevails in our economy. And so became a cooperative activist, became as an attorney and I have an MBA as well, um, something of a cooperative business developer helping people start co-ops in particular. And that led me down this path. Thomas and I are both graduates of Quincy Law School, and many, many years ago, and different I, times. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm told. Um, many years ago, I um, worked for a major law firm, corporate law firm, and you know, was basically helping rich people get richer. And uh, and I stopped practicing law. Decided it was time for me to sort of devote myself to my family and. Time for me to get back into the workforce, I decided that corporate law wasn't what I wanted to do. And that's when I started getting into co op development and just really love the fact that I'm working with people to help themselves and to start their own businesses and value their community. And when I made the decision to move to North Carolina, I really wanted to continue doing that here. So I feel very fortunate to have to have a uh, linked up with Thomas um, because he is just a great inspiration for the co-op movement in the in the South in addition to North Carolina and so I'm just starting to add my two cents to what we're doing. So All right. <laughs> so here is our mission. We started Carolina Common Enterprise about two years ago um, in the summertime of 2012 with this idea so cooperatives can be almost any kind of business. And cooperatives can be um, you know, a local food cooperative. There is a, a cooperative of basically uh, mechanical engineers, business engineering in Madison, and they design industrial process automation. Okay, very high level stuff. They bill tens of millions of dollars a year. It's owned by the engineers and the skilled workers that do all the design. So that's a cooperative too. Cooperatives operate in any segment of the um, community. And we want to help get that going because it's a more just economic form. But in terms of our particular mission, we want to bring uh, the cooperative enterprise model to marginalized communities. <coughs> So the types of services that Carolina Common Enterprise offers is we do business education, we do provide direct technical assistance, um, like we're both working with some um, startup food co-ops across the state in marginalized communities. Um, and we work at their community meetings, we're helping them get going, we're encouraging them, you know, we're keeping the movement moving forward. 
uh, organizational development trainings, and then we do these other things, applied research. We are with attorneys. I get my license in two months here, and then uh, group facilitation. So we're sort of a full service shop. We're essentially management consultants, again, for regular people that want to start cooperative enterprises. Co-op business is not something that's really taught in colleges. It's not taught in business schools. There are a few isolated programs. And it's not something that's um, widely available to people. And it's not something that's really well understood in our culture, except in a, a few parts of the country. And so we're, in part, just spreading this cooperative gospel, but we're backing it up with solid business knowledge and organizational development skills. Right, and so sometimes when people first hear about co-ops, they think, oh, this just sounds so cool. You know, I, let's, let's form a co-op. And you know, one of the things that we have to do, you know, we have to make them step back and say, okay, that's great. Legal structure is great, and this is a way for a lot of people to be involved and to be a part of this business, but you've got to have a business plan. Got to have to have a good, solid business foundation. Foundation, because in the end, a co-op is just not a business, right? We got to be smart about what we do. So that's why we, you know, not only are we doing organizational development, we do business type as well. There's been a, a huge resurgence in, in interesting cooperatives and, and cooperative startups since the economic collapse, since essentially the Wall Street model failed the country. Um, and it's bounced back and is doing well for Wall Street, but the rest of the country, uh, not so much. And cooperative economics is about keeping the value that you create and keeping things in the community, and that works well for people. So we're working with, um, as Becky said, food co-op startups in marginalized communities. What is commonly called food deserts, I really hate that term for a number of reasons, but that's you know the common explanation. So in Southeast Raleigh, there were two Kroger stores, and Kroger just shut down. You know, it's not that they weren't making money. It wasn't that there wasn't cash flow in the businesses. You know, those groceries were failing. It's that they weren't making enough money. Okay, so people have to buy food. And now in Southeast Raleigh, there's no place um, to buy groceries except at convenience stores. And so we're working with the community there to build their own food store that um, can provide the healthy food that they need um, at affordable prices and to fill the gap that was left by Kroger's investment plan. And by the way, that's called Fertile Ground Food Co-op, and you can buy your, your share in Fertile Ground Food Co-op now if you go online. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about our specific initiatives and initiatives in the co-op initiative. Sure. So we're working with Fertile Ground and other food co-ops to try to create, in addition to local food co-ops, essentially a purchasing co-op for these food co-ops in order to take advantage of economies of scale, in order to obtain um, fresh produce you know, locally, in order to obtain groceries and other packaged goods um, at a more effective pricing model. So that's a big picture there. We're also looking at opportunities for worker co-ops, essentially a business is cooperatively owned by the employees. Um, so I mentioned the uh, business engineering, that's a worker co-op of engineers and tool and die makers. Um, in Morgan's in North Carolina, we work with Opportunity Threads, which is a cut and sew, commercial cut and sew textile production company. They make clothing, they make tire covers, whatever, as long as it's sewn out of fabric, um, they do it on a contract basis. And that business started in 2010 and has grown enormously. Then. And they're actually, for the first time, looking at giving themselves a pay raise. So it's proven to be a sustainable business in what was once a dying industry in North Carolina. And so we're looking at other opportunities in the textile industry in that region to take existing businesses, maybe with um, you know a founder owner who's getting a little gray and looking for an exit, to convert that to worker ownership to help the workers buy out the boss as a cooperative, and to again create kind of a cluster of cooperatives that can um, have a self-supporting economic 
ecosystem in the foothills? Well, so at this point, um, we kind of like to know a little bit about you and what your level of knowledge is about co-ops. We were, we were asked to make a presentation on co-ops one-on-one, so this is going to be pretty basic. Like well, that? I heard about this one co-op. Um, uh, I say in the States, not in Canada, so. Yeah. But um, they basically just made bread. And it was in an area where most people couldn't even get a job. And the guy who was basically stacked bread, um, his pay worked at 40 bucks an hour. Where if he had to work somewhere else, he'd be getting a minimum wage in that that may be uh, Ars Mendy Bakery in the Bay Area, which is essentially an anti-franchise of worker cooperative bakeries. And they you know, started with one business, actually a cheese business, that got into making pizza and bread and spun off a bunch of these bakeries, which still makes excellent pizza. Um, and other baked goods. And it's, it's a you know, commercial retail production bakery that's completely worker-owned, and it's a cluster of those. They're all Arizona bakeries, they're all in the Bay Area, and they start a new one every year. So again, it's a self-supporting economic network, and as opposed to making $10 and $15 an hour, those worker-owners get the entire value right. of their labor and make considerably more money. I don't know if it's $40 an hour, but it's really high compared to the wage for bakers. Is it fair to say that as a business model, it's very old? It's not that old, it's about 150. Yes and no. I mean, human nature is cooperative. I mean, we have a competitive element, but we also have this cooperative element, and that's why you know humans have survived to the point we have, because we know how to get along. And cooperative economics existed long before mercantile economics, long before capitalism. Right. In terms of the modern era, you know, the concept of uh, we know the cooperative kind of emerged in response to capitalism and the industrial revolution. Right. Because you say, you know, maybe not today, but five years ago, you said co-op to me. I'm thinking of you know a pre World War One farmer in Louisiana. Oh. You know that that sort of thing. That's not what those people. <laughs> Is that right? That, well, but Let's, was, it, was that a, was the co-op model a business that I mean was it, did did it have anything in common with what you know we know of today as a co-op? I mean, I guess other than maybe owner worker. Oh, um, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll get into so we, the three we could spend you know a week yeah. seminar on the history right. of cooperatives, but yeah, I mean the idea first emerged around the industrial revolution. It emerged as a way for people working in, you know, the, the town is Rochdale, England. It was a mill town. It was uh, a textile town. And the people were being driven off the land into the cities and working in appalling conditions in these mills and being sold appallingly bad food by um, unscrupulous merchants. And so they formed their own grocery store, essentially, where they could get flour that didn't have plaster of Paris mixed into it, or they could get vegetables that were rotten, um, you know, get pure food um, on their own. And that was the Rochdale Society of Equitable Pioneers in 1844. And that was the first in this Western model. And that co-op never really ceased operations. It's you know, changed form and ownership, but it still exists to this day. Um. I'll get to you in just a minute. It, and in the United States, the co-op movement became more prevalent, especially around after World War II, um, in the Midwest, um, because you know a lot of rural areas they wanted electricity and they wanted telephone service, and you know the major corporations weren't they were to lose money if they brought those services out there. So that's when the town spoke, you know, the people who were living in the country got together and informed the, the rural electric and the rural utilities, which I find really interesting coming back to North Carolina from North Dakota because the rural electrics in North Dakota are called co-ops. But here, they're called the member corporations. They're called what? Member, member corporations. corporations. In South Carolina, they're co-ops. 
situation where you have to stitch it back together to keep it going and you know most of them make it but some of them don't are you going to talk about issues surrounding keeping a co-op going because you know there's that initial optimism I mean you know in the business plan works out for the first five years but then you know someone leaves something happens that's essentially why we're here in the state is to provide that kind of um, technical support to help co-ops get past those points to do the business planning so that they can anticipate those issues that type of thing because there aren't any other cooperative development centers in the south um, at all so we're, we're for the south we're doing a new thing the cooperative economy has a deep history in New England the west coast you know the upper midwest um, the south you know, the history of labor and cooperative economics has taken a different path. So we're trying to fill that gap. It, it, it seems to be the problem with the line when you get to a point of some sort of growth. You know, who, who gets a line share after that first round of people? You get other people who want to come in and put all the work in. You who have been there for a while, they're like, no, you can't get that much. You know what I mean? I mean, so that, that seems like more of an issue for me as a from a, from a business person standpoint. So what do you do with the growth and the value that you have going forward? So you don't have a model to 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 uh, to pass that. That's a, a common issue, especially in, in work our own cooperatives. It's like we put in the blood and sweat in order to start this business and we intended for it to be you know a benefit to everybody that participates. But you know, the Johnny come lately yeah. gets as much benefit as I do, and I'm the one that invested you know, my life in this. So how do we compensate the founders? And so there's, you know, different approaches to that. It's something that our community is aware of and experimenting with, because that's always been a hurdle with cooperatives. Right, and, and try to abide by the seven cooperative principles will get to and you know and always have those principles guide the conversation especially with respect to compensation well, something I want to throw out, I don't want to, um, I don't want to be a wet blanket here. I, I get my electricity from a co-op, co and I belong, get my groceries from a co-op, and Demont Biofuels has a co-op, and um, so I am a big advocate. But, it, just because you're a co-op doesn't make you good. So, uh, you have to think about mission. Uh, we have, for instance, a uh, Farm Bureau here in North Carolina, and Farm Bureau would, is a cooperative, and Farm Bureau is, uh, you know, probably the furthest right-winged, non-environmental, homophobic, horrible human rights organization. <laughs> Don't say you really feel it. <laughs> yeah, so, so, just say. And you're completely you, cutthroat, isn't it? Yeah, so sure. people right. tend to think, you know, co-op's good, business evil. No, 
co-ops can be evil, business can be good. So I think you have to drill back a little bit to mission. Just want to throw that up. Yeah, mission and principles. And you know, just some of the older, larger co-ops, they don't look like co-ops. I mean, exactly. hey, just to add on to that, those of us that have run co-ops and been involved in co-ops, there's there are real challenges that have been pointed out with co-ops that you have to address. That, so I, I'd say that there's trade-offs between a more traditional business structure and a co-op. You, you certainly, there's some advantages, but there's also some disadvantages um, to not having you know, a, a smaller number of people that have a heavy financial investment that are gonna, you know, they're gonna go down with the ship no matter what. They're gonna fight and fight and fight. With a co-op, you can, people will, you know, they, they may not go down with the ship, you know, fight the so there's, there's, there's some challenges. Right. And that's why it's so important to hire excellent Many. <laughs> okay. Yes. I just wanted to know if there's, if there's any between a co-op and a uh, non-for-profit. There is a, yes, there is a big difference. Go ahead. Okay. So a co-op is a business. A co-op is an enterprise. It operates in a market and generally has something of value that it trades in. And that can differ considerably as we'll explore. But, um, a co-op has to have positive fat cash flow. Um, it's a business like any other. And so it doesn't exist for financial return on investment, and therefore it's not technically for profit, but it exists for the benefit of the people that use it. And so it's you know, a business. A nonprofit is essentially a corporation that doesn't have any owners. Property has owners, it exists for its owners. And so that's the, I guess the technical distinction is nonprofit, no ownership. It's just for a public purpose of some sort. Um, a cooperative is a business purpose. But in addition to that, cooperatives maybe in the beginning might go out and seek grants to get started, but they can't technically receive those grants, right? They can't technically receive donations, they have to use a physical agent to do they that. They don't exist for a charitable purpose. Right, because cooperatives do not exist for a charitable purpose. They exist for their members' benefit. Okay. Are you saying that it is possible for a cooperative to have a fiscal agent? Because usually a fiscal pass-through sponsorship arrangement involves one organization who is a 501 now and another one who will be one in the future. Because you can't just pass through a 501 to a for-profit entity. It, it, I mean, there are rules about fiscal sponsorship. Yes. Yeah. And there's, you know, we're dealing with marginalized communities. We're dealing the with low income, poverty, development aspect. Okay. And so it's, you know, it has to fit the mission of whatever the fiscal sponsor is. So if you've got a fiscal sponsor that's about energy conservation and promoting biofuels and stuff like that, it might fit the mission. And there might be a way to um, align a fiscal sponsorship. But we're, we're not here to talk about this. We can talk about that later, because that's an important issue. Um, but a cooperative is a principle-based business. You know, in um, traditional sort of investor-driven businesses, the principle is for the business, whatever it is, to create excess money that goes back to the investors. It's for the extraction of profits. A cooperative is based on a different set of principles. We have a slide for that. Right. So, what is a co-op? First of all, it is a business that is owned and controlled by the people who use its services. So, you go shop at Kroger, who owns the business? Not you. Mr. Kroger. Mr. Kroger. Yeah. You know, to investors, Wall Street, um, you know, who works in the business? Not the owners. Who shops there? No. Not the owners. And, you know, what influence do the workers there have on, you know, what, how, how the river operates its business? Not at all. The co-ops follow what we call the three U's. They're user owned, user controlled, and user benefit. And what that means is the members of the business, they control the business by appointing a management, right, to run the business, or they can do it themselves. And then they're the ones who are gaining from its use. We're going to talk about the benefits that they might enjoy. 
So, well, let's, we all have some experience with cooperatives. So, you know, who, who here now belongs to a cooperative of some sort? So you're an owner of a co-op. Um, what co-op do you belong to? What are co-ops? Two. I'm on the board of directors of the Omaha Biofuels Cooperative. And I still hold a share in a food cooperative in Ames where I went to school years ago. I kept the share when I left because I was that proud to be a member. Good. So one over here, who is a co-op owner? One over a bunch of hands. Six food co-ops and a field co-op. Okay. Uh, bank with state employees, which is co-op. Yeah, credit unions. Central insurance companies. So the idea is we're, we're looking at a business that's based on use, on a beneficial use to the people that own it, and that's controlled by the people that you, well, owned by the people that use it, controlled by the people that use it, and um, is for the benefit of the people that use it. So a food co-op, in general, who are the owners? What is the beneficial use? Shoppers. Shoppers. And uh, so Chatham County Market, how is that co-op governed? Board of Directors. Board of Directors, elected by the ownership. Who are the shoppers? Yeah. I'm really interested in these biofuel co-ops. So could one of you explain, you know, who owns the biofuel co-op and what use do they make of it? I think there's going to be a couple different answers to that question. So I think mine might be really sort of the most like selfish one, I guess. A uh, bunch of people getting together to get access to fuel. So they don't make it. They don't do any sort of distribution. It's borderline. It's like a private buyer's club. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's kind of what, what we, uh, we own the co-op to essentially expand our access to B100, uh, 9,000 high quality fuel that we can put in our BMWs all the way down to our, our power stroke 250s out on our farms. And effectively it's more like a buyer's club than a producer's club. Although we are part of a co-op that started as a producer's club for a producer buyer. And so we, our mission as a, as a co-op now is to expand that and to see B100 become a mass market fuel, which is almost impossible to envision happening my mind without a co-op structure because of the incumbent's ability to control access, distribution, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the feedstocks, everything. So, so we're talking in, in these instances about basically the consumers, kind of like the grocery, who are the owners of the co-op, and the beneficial use is being able to obtain uh, B100 as a product. They wouldn't necessarily need to be able to obtain from ordinary market channels. Are there any other, other permutations on the biofuel co-op model? Sure, and I'm gonna start with a question and I'll tell you what I mean. Um, you say user, and I guess I see three roles, owner, worker, customer, and I'm not sure what you mean by user. And I'll tell you what, what we look at is we want all three to be together. We would like the owner and the customer to be the worker as well. Right? And that's what we're looking at. We want to provide access. We centralized equipment that many people can use. Right? We get a BioPro, multiple people can use it rather than having 20 BioPros in garages. Right? And so that means that you are a worker and you are the consumer and those people are also the owners. And so that's what we're looking at is our model for cooperative. So with the sort of consumer oriented biofuel co-ops, the shared asset is just this purchasing channel. And what you're talking about is this additional asset of essentially manufacturing. Yeah. So there's a shared use of purchasing and distribution, but a shared use of equipment as well. Yes. So you could take that a step further and say, um, you know, an agricultural co-op, you know, a group of farmers might get together to share the use of a um, harvesting machine or something that's, you know, a big piece of equipment that they couldn't afford to purchase individually. Grain elevators are, you know, a stereotypical agricultural cooperative thing. It's a shared asset that helps everybody by being able to store and market their grain. 
So the user concept comes in in terms of, you know, there's different ways of using the business. When we talk about consumers, just having the ability that you couldn't get through regular market channels, that's the use is the um, availability of the product. Um, if you're talking about equipment, then the use is the use of that equipment. Um, if you're a farmer, maybe you are aggregating your crops to sell more effectively in the market. So there are, you know, land to lakes, butter, you know, it's a dairy cooperative and all these farmers who are owners are aggregating their milk products to sell to land to lakes and have this brand, which is part of the collective asset, you know, the distribution channels, everything of land to lakes is essentially to enable the members to sell. So this, the use there is to sell. Uh, we talked about the bakery cooperative that's worker. So the use there is to basically be able to trade your labor, your baking skills, and the assets of the bakery um, into an income stream. So there are different types of use, and that's why we focus on use rather than a particular type, because it can vary tremendously. Right. And I was, before I left North Dakota, I was working with some corn growers, and they were disturbed by the price of fertilizer, right? Can't go up and up and up and up and up. So they decided to get together, and they're going to <coughs> build their own anhydrous ammonia plant. So they, they control the price of the fertilizer. Okay, so this gets back to basics, co-ops versus corporations. We've already talked about this concept of the members being benefited. So co-ops benefit their members. They are service-driven. Corporations will benefit their shareholders being profit-driven. Of course, with a co-op, we'd like to see a little, we'd like to see money made as well. Yes? So in a co-op, say you work in the media, you consider it your income or is there a different type of, of way you file your income from a co-op? If you're a member of co-op, mostly it's not the income you're concerned about. It's whatever that beneficial use of. And I think the big exception there is a worker in a co-op, where you are essentially a member of the co-op to have a job. There you are concerned about your financial income. Um, but for the most part, you know, a co-op has to have revenue, it has to have sales, whether the sales are to the members or to the public, um, you know, again, depending. But like every business, your revenue has to exceed your expenses so that you have positive cash flow. And co-op, we don't really call it profits because it's not a financial profit. There's money left over. That's basically money that the consumers have either overspent, um, you know, that particular year on you know whatever food they buy at the co-op, and therefore it's returned to them. But it's their money to begin with because they're the owners, and that money exists because they spend it at the co-op. But if you work there, you mean if you work there? Yeah, if you work there. If you work there, there and you just like you get your paycheck and they've taken your taxes out. W2 like anybody else. Oh, yeah. Yes, as a worker. Yeah. Regular income tax still applies. Yes. Yeah. What death in taxes can Would you know about the model that I described where the worker, consumer, owner are all amalgamated together? Do you think that, um, are we supposed to pay taxes on the benefit that we generate for ourselves? I mean, if you make something for yourself, then you're also the you know you 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 are receiving benefit in non-financial terms. Is that an income? I, I'm not a tax lawyer. Some of that. Okay. 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 But, no, no. You could maybe make a distinction between. I, I can see your business working in two ways. Either you're a group of people sharing equipment. Yeah. For your own personal use. So you go, you make your fuel, and you take it home with you. Yes. Or you could be an organization that. You're all working there on this piece of equipment, and you sell fuel to other people or to yourselves, but you're, there's a financial transaction there. So th those are two models, and I think the right. way the taxes would work would be vastly different if you're using you know, the money cycling model versus the, I'm just going to use you know, the co-op's blender. 
So right, if you're if you're selling that fuel, you would sell it to yourselves as well. Yes. But what you're doing is that's a shared expense. The ownership and maintenance of that equipment is a shared expense. The purchase of the feedstock is a shared expense. And so you're paying into this business, um, and you want to pay in so that it has you know a positive cash flow. But you're paying in. That's a personal expense of yours. That's not um, income that you're earning from that. But yes, if you were to say we have this surplus biofuel, we've done a really good job, so let's you know sell it into the market, then that is you know essentially tax and lending. And that's a common thing. I mean, Chatham County Market, it sells to its members, it sells to people that aren't members. Well, the revenue from sales to people that aren't members is taxable income for that cooperative. So there is that kind of distinction if, between if they were adding Right. But the revenue from the owners is also taxable. Yeah. Are you sure? Well, that that is. Is. So what I'm saying is that I don't, uh, I'm certainly not certain about this, but yeah. the members, if I'm a member of the marketplace and I go and spend $100 there, and that adds up into profit, it would add up into the same profit bucket, and if they end up having profit greater than expenses, the tax is going to be paid on that income to the marketplace as a business. Not differentiating my dollar than your dollar because you're not a member. Yeah, but it's, again, kind of a shared expense, and so the money that I spend, if there's surplus revenue, either it's returned to me as a cash payout, a patronage dividend, or it's reinvested. Yeah. And so, in general, that is not a taxable. Okay, so it's I think maybe it is taxable. Just as an individual, if you get a dividend back from the co-op, does that advance if it's beyond your investment number? No, you've already paid tax on that. You paid your income tax on it. You're buying stuff, and you've overpaid. You're just getting back an overpayment. That's not. So, so, so the co-op pays the tax, and then the patronage comes out. Right. To the extent that there is income tax on the co-op level, it's tax there too. Yeah. We're getting a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is what I'm talking about. How do we set up a co-op? two groups of stakeholders, both who are invested in the continued success of the business. The consumers, because they want to continue to have this really nice grocery store and get organic foods. And the workers, because they want to have a job. And so two different uses, two different types of benefit, but a common goal in, in the success of the business. Now, recently there's been a trend to even add other types of classes of membership. So you, a multi-stakeholder cooperative could have consumer, producer, and worker members. And in fact, the um, Sandhills Farm <coughs> CSA down in Moore County, they have sort of introduced the model of having all three different types of members in their co-op. So with Weaver Street, for example, there's bound to be members that are farmers, <coughs> local farmers who are producers for the co-op, they also are probably consumers. Why, but how would you distinguish them out if they were producers? Would you give them some different kind of membership? Would they get yes. some different kind of they benefits? They have a different, they are a different type of member. And how would that benefit them differently than a me as a consumer? Well, they're suppliers. They, they, right. they're, there's a customer for them. So right. they're invested right. in the success of it because that's a customer. I'm just, I mean, I, I, get their, I get the reason they do it. I'm just wondering, do they get paid a different amount? Do they get something different back? I mean, 
I'm just curious. It's so think of what's his name, Hendricks model how it didn't work. It's the producers are going to elect their people from their producer membership to buy for the best interest of the producers. The consumers are going to elect from their membership to buy for the best interest of their consumers. The um, you know, workers are going to do the same thing. And, and what you're going to do is you're going to put all of these interests together in presumably the best interest of the overall co-op. But so exactly. the producer gets like, oh, and so do you regulate to some extent so there can't be too many consumers versus producers versus workers? And you have to do the math on that. Yes. 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 And everyone is different. And there, yeah. there was a new one in Wisconsin that added distributors. Uh -huh. um, right? So sure. they've got there's four there. different classes. Yes. And they're seven, all trying seven classes. Seven classes. Wow. Wow. I'm not sure what the other We're all watching that one. Well, yeah. I, I, I can't yeah. wait to listen on their board meetings. That's going to be yeah. a lot of fun. That's fascinating. Okay. So it's you know it's a negotiated balance, and yeah. oftentimes it's an ongoing negotiation. Mm -hmm. But again, it's primarily about the mutual benefit, right. and that's you know again the overriding tension that co op that you brought up earlier is um, you know between the benefit for me and the benefit for the collective good. So the, yeah, so it's very important that the founding members really spend a lot of time knowing what their guiding principles are, right? So, that they, so for example, this co-op in Wisconsin with seven different classes, they're all about food system. That they want to do everything they can to make the local food system work for all of the members in the five different, I guess there's seven different classes within a food system. And the shared use primarily is a big distribution center. Yeah. So everybody's got a stake in the flow of that food at different stages. We have a couple of questions in the last one. Well, I just have a comment. That's what I was thinking about. The biodiesel uh, co-op system. If you want to scale it up, why not have a distribution uh, uh, co-op with the uh, food co-op, that's the problem with uh, the food industry. But I have a uh, food, I mean, back to the condiment brand. And so these, our, these smaller companies, we're the ones who have the best products, the low sodium, the healthier stuff, but these distributors want too much money. So we need to do a, the, a bio food, that's going to drop our overhead to fuel, do uh, uh, distribution of trucks, and know how to make some and get it to the co-ops, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so okay. some shared marketing and distribution. Right. Yeah. Inside North Carolina. And, and you know, the, the local food system development, the local food council, that's really growing in the state now. And so I think we're going to see more and more of these sort of multi-level cooperatives forming as a result of the local food system. So you got any questions? The initial capital expenditure, or does how does that? It will vary. Yeah, I mean, well, I think it's a very amount, but where where do you raise that? How do you get that? And I think that's where you're talking about the uh, 501c3 is going to help form this if it if it misses, matches the mission of that rural development can, grant or whatever. It, it's so, like when you're when you're forming a business and you know that this business is going to cost two and a half million dollars for startup. Yeah. Are you going to raise two and a half million dollars in equity? Probably not. You're going to raise a certain percentage of that, and then you're going to borrow the other amount. So you're going to what a co-op provides is is the equity. The members provide the equity portion of the startup. Okay, and so. If you, need, so long, if, you, if you need to raise, if you need to raise eight hundred thousand dollars because you're going to start a food co-op, you need eight hundred thousand <coughs> in equity, but you need two million. Three. Okay. For that the might, that might work in grant, but not with buying. No, so what you do is your members are the ones that raise the capital for you. In theory, where, where you get into trouble is when it's your money, and I'm a member. 
and we're all equals. Right. That's it. Right. It becomes a little tense. So the members, there's like a membership level. So like with our low-income neighborhoods, food costs, they're starting their membership, their share fee at $100. Okay? And then, you know, they may have even like, you know, pay over time, so $25 every three months, whatever, they'll, they'll pay until they earn, they pay their whole share. Then, then co-ops are also capitalized with member loans, right? So each member only is going to pay $100, right? So you're all equal. But then those people who can afford it, they can be tapped for a loan. Right? But they don't get a greater share of they don't get decision a greater making. Share, they don't, right, they don't, Sorry, they don't. They don't have to get a greater share, right? I mean, you could also give them a greater share, mm -hmm. couldn't you? But that's no. violating no. cooperative no, it's, no, it's, one, it's one member, one vote. Yeah. So you've got a million in, and I've got fifty bucks in. We're equals. Well, right. That's what I'm saying, though, is that that's the problem that Lyle's describing. Right. Is that if, if it's one member, one vote, and I put in a million, and he put in fifty, and we each get a vote. Sounds like it's pretty unlikely you're going to put in a million. But right. You can also be. Does that just make, make me an idiot? If Lyle got to vote for fifty and I got to vote for a million, am I just a nine hundred thousand dollar idiot? Yes. No. Yeah. <laughs> Generally, first of all, the best to get that lob side. The first rule of a co-op is that everybody has skin in the game, and everybody has an equal amount of skin in the game because it's for mutual benefit. Like every startup business. Startup financing is tricky. It doesn't matter what kind of business you're in, and it calls for creative solutions. So we talked about we have, you know, everybody has an equal membership, but then different members who have better, more um, resources can lend money to the co-op for a reasonable return, you know, at an interest rate, or if they're feeling generous for no interest. Um, you can do preferred shares, which is what we did in the Hendersonville community co-op where you're making an equity investment, you're getting a, a guaranteed return on that, but that preferred share doesn't carry a vote. But it's, you know, an investment that you can make because you can look at your investment every single day when you shop there, as opposed to investing in preferred shares on Wall Street, where you're throwing your money at them and you don't see what's happening to it. So there's different ways of feeling that security in this kind of investment. And as Becky was saying, you can raise a certain amount of equity from your member base, and then you go to lenders. And those lenders can be a bank. But the Hendersonville Food Co-op, we went to self-help. We went to North Country Development Fund, um, Natural Capital Investment Fund. These are all lenders that are focused on cooperatives and on sustainable businesses. So there's a growing sector in, in, in financial industry for these types of businesses. And it is a, you know, it's like any kind of business, it's going to be a problem raising startup capital. The cooperative movement is working on uh, ways of doing that in the family. Have y'all built a model with say a million dollar biodiesel plant that has a member co-op? Uh, I mean is a co-option and how you bring that from the out of the ground. I don't know how they do that in uh, North Dakota. With, uh, it, it's the same uh, way as, as with the consumer food co-op. You set what your member price, member share price is going to be. So with you know a million dollar biofuel manufacturing facility, that member share will most likely be a lot higher because I would assume you have fewer members, right? So you, you're going to determine how much equity you need to raise, okay? And then you divide that by how many members you think you're going to have. So you're That's talking what you're sharing. Sure. You're talking you're saying you can do 10 members if you wanted to? Sure. A, a co-op is just like a corporation. In, in, it's not any different. It's just like a corporation. It just so happens that the shareholders are totally removed from the process and getting a check, and they don't care where it's coming from as long as they're getting checked. They're involved in the process. That's the one difference. It's still and democratic. It's democratically involved. Yes. Democratic. You, you are 
you involve your business, but it's still the same deal. You can still go out, get a loan from a bank. You're still a business. You still act like a business. You just happen to be more in your business than exactly. you would be other guys. Exactly. And, 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 and with biodiesel production, there's a lot of you know asset bases, a lot of the capital equipment mm -hmm. acquisition, the the finance. <coughs> That's well understood by many banks, and as long as you've got the, the, the machinery you're going to put in place, the factory you want to buy, the land you want to put it on, financing that I don't think is is this whole different animal just because you're a co-op. You still have to securitize right. it. It's going to have exactly. some. And you have to have a business plan that does <coughs> yeah. positive cash flow right. indefinitely in the future. Right. It's going to lend you if you have right. that, no matter how mission oriented it is. No, and they're not. I mean, they're a different way of doing business. In the interest of time, could you flash the rest of your... Okay. Sure. Oh, sure. Why are we not going to get to the... <laughs> <laughs> start with the use principles, but that's a benefit to help people um, meet their mutual economic needs. But more than that, we've got some additional principles that the cooperative movement has agreed upon that under, underlines all of our business activities. So democratic member control, we talked about that. Economic participation. Um, you know, everybody has skin in the game, essentially. Autonomy and independence, that's really important. That, you know, a co-op doesn't, isn't beholden to a government. A co-op isn't beholden to another business or shareholders, it's autonomous. There is, well, we'll get to principle six. Um, that a co-op is more than just a business. It's about the benefit of its members, and that benefit includes education and training and information. So if you're gonna start a worker co-op, all the worker owners need to have some business education so they can understand their role in the business. They can understand the cash flow, that type of thing. Um, consumer co-op is oriented towards education, perhaps about food and things like that. Um, an important principle is cooperation between cooperatives. So. If we are going to be doing business as a cooperative, we want to favor and help other cooperatives in the way we do business too. And lastly, we have a concern for community, which includes a concern for the environment. That we aren't going to, um, you know, pollute in the community we, we work in. We're not going to um, harm the community where we operate because we are a part of the community. And I think that's an important piece to finish on, is that a cooperative is essentially a community that's anchored in the community. Because it's owned by the members, it's governed by the members, the people that use the business, a cooperative is not going to outsource itself overseas. A cooperative is, is not going to, um, you know, lay people off just, you know, on a whim. Because it's capital that's owned in the community. It's an asset that's owned in the community. It's very geographically rooted. And um, <laughs> you don't shit where you sleep. They're all in the How is it that every other person is in Florida? Yeah. How about that? That's a Yeah. You know, the concept that co ops not co ops can maybe help some of you guys. It's helped Piedmont in the past. So we dispense fuel down in Wilmington in the parking lot of Tyler Creek Co-op. So if you're looking for a place to put a fuel dispenser, your co-op grocery store is a very good start. And oftentimes, you know, it's kind of the same demographic. People who want to pay a premium for good food may also be the ones that want to pay a premium for good fuel. And so, and, and when you call up your basic co-op as a co-op, and you say, 
I want to do this in the parking lot. The principles kick in. Co-ops help co-ops, and it gives you a game. At grassroots level, you go to a co-op and the people know what you're talking about. Yeah. Because it is a principle-driven business, in whatever form it takes, um, everybody has this same understanding of what the purpose of the business is. Great, time any questions? Five minutes. Five minutes. Any more questions? You, sir, and you. Um, are you this CCE, are you guys associating or do you work with NCBA at all? National Cooperative Business Association? Yeah. yeah. Um, good relationship there. So I guess I'm hearing this idea. One person is one member, is one share, is one vote. And once you're a member, you can also make a financial contribution. You just don't get any more influence. You can then loan us a million dollars. You can get a 6% return on your loan or whatever. You're not getting another vote for your million dollars. Right. You're getting a return on finances for your million dollars. But you are still one person. That's right. And one member, one person, that could mean you are one worker. Or that could mean you are one consumer. Right. right? So in a cooperative, in a corporation, people vote their shares. And if I own 100 shares and you own two shares, you know, I win all the time. So, corporation, you vote your shares, the money votes. Right. In a cooperative, people vote. And that is the point. Okay. It's democratic capitalism. You can only have one share. You can't go buy 10 more shares. You can't buy 51% of the controlling interest and vote people out. You only get one, and you're only one right. person. Exactly. Stop. And therefore, have to get along. Yes. You, know, you have to be able to cooperate. Right. So unlike corporations, cooperatives really are people. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> They're made of people. Can a corporation be a member of a Corporations are people. Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah. A, there's a sector of cooperatives called purchasing cooperatives that are basically um, businesses that are sharing purchasing power. A really good one is the um, IPC, the International Pharmacy Cooperative, so independent pharmacy cooperative. So all these little mom and pop pharmacies are able to compete now because they can belong to purchasing cooperatives that have the purchasing power of the car drugs, the CVSs, and and that's that's why they exist at all these days. And cooperatives be members of cooperatives. So, so we've, we've actually had a problem with our state on this one. They told us that uh, only individuals could be members of like a fuel cooperative. So what we're saying is if you're a trucking business, can a trucking business be a member of a biofuels cooperative? If the biofuels cooperative has a producer-consumer license to make our own fuel, can another trucking company be a member of the cooperative? Is yes. that, that is? Yes. Well, and that is set by someone other than the state? I mean, could our state have a law that prohibits that? Okay, so business entity are creatures of state law. And corporation law is fairly uniform among the states. LLC law is formally fairly uniform among the states, although there's a bit more variation because LLC is newer. Um, but generally, you go from state to state. You have the same expectations of what the law that does. With cooperatives, it's not the case. It's complete patchwork. Um, and some cooperative entity statutes say, you can do any kind of business in a cooperative form. And others say you can be a farm business, an agriculture business, and that's all. And so really a cooperative is not a choice of entity. A cooperative is how you own and govern the business. And so you can take a business corporation and you can say this corporation is one person's own share, one vote, and this is how we're going to do things in a cooperative manner. And you're a cooperative, it, you know, but type of business entity isn't necessarily going to dictate how you do the business. So if you're in a state where you have to have a particular purpose where you can only be um, you know, living persons to be a member of a cooperative, we'll just set up an LLC and have that structured as a cooperative. That's what we, you know, have North Carolina's principles. What and then one member, one vote. Uh, yeah, let me jump in here very quickly to make an announcement. So lunch is on, however, there's a bit of a line right now. So it's you can continue this conversation and dribble out there over the next seven or so minutes, and that might work really well. So just know that. If you all went out there now, you're going to be standing in line, and the first one there would probably be four or five minutes to get to the food thing. So it's like that. Thank you. Uh, well, one, I'm sorry, one other thing. Eric, you and Nasa need to connect because you're going to be next on video. Eric, that's Eric? Oh, OK. Thanks. I'd say thank you very much.